with Free Thinking Ministries. Again, I'm in a room with my friends, a bunch of youth pastors and other people that care about apologetics. And today, we're going to discuss what I think is one of the most confusing and one of the most controversial arguments in the entire cumulative case for God's existence. Uh, this argument has its roots in, uh, with a guy named St. Anselm, centuries ago. And this argument is called the ontological argument. It's a big word. Uh, I was talking about this earlier, and uh, Noah, Noah, did you say that you confuse this word with, with what? Uh, ontological with what? Ornithology. 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 <laughs> the study of birds. Yes. Right? Yes. So yeah, we're not going to study birds today. We're going to study God. So, before we do that, uh, before we get into the ontological argument, it's vital that we properly define a few words. So, let's begin by defining some terms. Let's start with the word impossible. Impossible, what does that mean? What can't be. What cannot be. That's what it means to be impossible. All right, simple enough. What about possible? What does possible mean? What can be? If something can be or could be, then it's possible. It's possible it could happen. If it's possible that it could happen, then it can be. One more word. Necessary. What does it mean to be necessary? Well, if something is necessary, that means that it must be. It must be the case. In any circumstance that you can think of, it must be. That's what it means to be necessary. <clears throat> now, there's two ways to understand the word possible. And we're going to discuss, uh, Chris and I were talking about it earlier, epistemic possibilities versus ontological possibilities. Let's start with epistemic possibilities. Epistemology is the study of knowledge. So uh, when it comes to epistemic possibilities, we're talking about a possibility of knowledge when we do not know what the true answer is. So, uh, for example, it's possible that lead has more atoms than gold. I don't know. I, I'm not a scientist, but you know, somebody says, hey, is it possible that lead has or, or does lead have more atoms than gold? I'd say, well, it's possible. Beats the heck out of me. I don't know. <laughs> um, what about if somebody says, hey, Tim, um, is 123 times 456, does that equal 56,188? You know, I'm not a good mathematician. I don't have a calculator. I'd be like, beats the heck out of me. Sounds good. Let's roll with it. It's possible anyway. It's possible that it's true. Actually, I'd be lazy if I did that because 123 times 456 is not 56,188. The answer is actually 56,088. But if you don't want to do the math, you might say, yeah, that's possible. That's in regards to epistemic possibilities. You just don't know for sure. Maybe, maybe you think a, a girl is lying to you. And then you ask her if she's lying. And she says, no, of course I'm not lying. Was well, it possible she's lying about that? You just don't know. Again, this is in regards to an epistemic possibility. It's possible she's lying. It's possible she's telling the truth. You're not in a position to know. Well, what about the existence of God? Well, maybe you say, oh, it's possible God exists. And it's possible he doesn't. Beats the heck out of me. Right, right, you're a good agnostic then. But that's dealing with epistemic possibilities. Now, if you think that it's actually possible that he could, but you just don't know for, know for sure, then that's going to lead us to some uh, conclusions. Anyway, we'll get to that soon. Let's discuss ontological possibilities. This has to do with the possibility of existence. So when we talk about ontology... We're, we're talking about the, the existence of something. Not knowledge, it's not, epistemology is the study of 
how we come to know things. Ontology is the study of things that exist, right? So this means what could exist or what could be real. For example, I can imagine a, a world, a possible world in which I don't work out and I eat pizza for every meal, which sounds great. Um, but in that world, I'd, I'd be a lot heavier. So we could call that uh, world uh, a Tim, Tim Stratton being fat world, okay? Um, where I just eat pizza all the time, which is what I desire to do, um, where I never work out, okay? But so I could have been very fat equals my being very fat is possible. It's possible. Or for example, I could have been a prince. Right? My being a prince is possible. We can imagine a, a world, you know, in a world where America decides that we want a monarchy. And so we, uh, we, uh, we take Russ Stratton from Holdridge, Nebraska and make him king of America. Well, if my dad, Russ Stratton, becomes king of America, and then what would that make me? <clears throat> the Prince of America. Tim Stratton, the Prince of America. Let's, all right, that's the new one. All right, but, <laughs> you know, we can imagine that crazy scenario, but it's not impossible. It's not like it's saying 2 plus 2 equals 10,000, right? It's not like saying a married bachelor exists. We can actually conceive of an implausible state of affairs that's possible. So, I could have been a prince. My being a prince is possible. You uh, could have chosen to punch me, Noah. Like five seconds ago, you could have just come up here and punched me in the face. In fact, nothing's stopping you from doing it right now. Thank you for not doing it. <laughs> um, but, but you choosing to punch me is possible. All right, Eric's not holding you back right now. There's, you're, you're not tied down. Nothing is stopping you. It's possible. Unicorns could have existed. A unicorn's existence is possible. We, can, uh, can, we, we know that horses exist, and we've seen animals with horns on their heads, and it stands to reason that if an animal can have two horns, then it could also have one horn. Uh, and it's, we can imagine, we can conceive of a horse with a single horn on its head. It's possible. It's not like trying to imagine a married bachelor. We studied the fine-tuning argument not long ago. And so we know that if the initial conditions of the Big Bang were just slightly different, slightly tweaked one way or the other, the universe could have been vastly different. In fact, the universe could have just been made of stars without any life. A universe just made of stars without any life is possible. All right, I'm looking into a camera right now that's on a table. You guys, is it possible that this table right here that this table could be made of cheese. Yeah. Possible. No. <laughs> it's impossible that that table could be made of cheese because it's made, of, that table is made of some kind of a wood thing and. That's just covering the cheese. Like. Oh, that's covering the cheese. That's <laughs> cheese possible. covered wood, I guess. <laughs> oh, no. that, I don't think there's any cheese in that table. But there, there could have been a table here in the exact same dimensions, it's made of cheese, but it's impossible for that table to be made of cheese. Now, Chris, we're going to have, after we get done with this whole thing, but we're going to have to cut this open, just to check, because it's possible. <laughs> All right. Is it possible I can get one of your trick questions right? <laughs> That's impossible. That's impossible. It's necessary that you will always get them wrong. Um, <laughs> All right. Could a square circle exist? Or could a triangle with four corners exist? Chris, I think you'll get that one there. Um, a square circle or a triangle with four corners can't exist. That is the same thing as saying a square circle or a triangle with four corners. They're impossible. It's impossible for those things to exist. What about this one? Could I exist? Chris is going nuts right now. He doesn't know. He's not even going to try. No. Could I exist? Well, not only could I exist, but I actually do exist. That might surprise you. I do exist. 
but I don't have to exist. We can easily imagine a world in which my parents never met each other. So I'm a contingent being. I don't have to exist. And if I'm contingent, and we can imagine a world in which my parents never met each other, then I do not exist necessarily. And there are possible worlds in which Tim Stratton doesn't exist. What about mathematics? Could 2 plus 2 equal 4? Well, not only could it equal 4, but it actually does equal 4. 2 plus 2 always equals 4. Because not only is it true that 2 plus 2 equals 4, it must, 2 plus 2 must always equal 4. It's necessary that 2 plus 2 equals 4. So in any possible world that you can conceive of, any possible world or set of circumstances that you can think of, 2 plus 2 will always equal 4. You can call these numbers different things, but this many things plus this many things will always equal that many things. 2 plus 2 always equals 4. It's impossible for it to be otherwise. So from now on, when we say possible, we simply mean the possibility of existence. We're not discussing epistemology, we are discussing ontology, hence the name, the ontological argument. So, if you think about something and it seems as if it could be real, even if you're not sure if it is, then it's possible. So, even if you don't think God probably exists, but you're like, hmm, it's possible that God exists, okay, well then God exists in a possible world. Hang on tight. Let's talk about reality, or possible realities. All right, when I say a reality or a world, that means that I'm talking about everything that exists, everything. So a possible reality is a way everything could have been. A possible reality doesn't have to be real, but it could have been real. Now think about this. I learned this from J.P. Moreland first classroom I ever had with him. Truth corresponds to reality, and reality is the way things are. But a possible reality is the way things could have been. So let's consider some possible worlds. All right, each one of these circles is a possible world. So this is a, a Tim is fat world. Okay? That's a possible world. I can imagine myself being really fat because I eat pizza all the time. Sounds fun. Okay, uh, then we've got Tim is the prince of America world. Okay? Possible world. Oh, then we got a unicorn world. What else do we got? Oh, only stars world. And then we've got our world. All right, actual, the actual world. All right, so we've got these five different possible worlds up here. Now, my being a prince is possible. Okay, we, we talked about why. It's possible that I could be a prince. So, so we, it gets a whole world to, to itself here. Now, if things were different or another world or reality were the real one, then I would be a prince in that world. So if something is possible, it exists in a possible reality or a possible world. So this is what's called possible world semantics. Okay, so just when, if you wonder if something is possible or not, you have to be able to conceive of it in a possible world. And if it's, if it's something that could exist in a possible world, then it could obtain here in this world. Um, more on that later. So if something is necessary in a reality, then it's necessary in all realities. Or if something is necessary 
in one possible world, then it's necessary in all possible worlds. So to make my point, in a possible world where I'm really fat, 2 plus 2 will equal 4. Okay? In a, even in a world in which I'm 100 pounds heavier than I am, 2 plus 2 is still going to equal 4. Well, what about in a world where Tim Stratton is the prince of the United States of America? Well, guess what? 2 plus 2 will still equal 4. That's necessary. That cannot change. What about where unicorns exist? Guess what? 2 plus 2 will still equal 4. Okay? And even in a world where only stars exist and no humans, no life anywhere else, no life in the universe at all, guess what? It's still a fact of the matter that 2 plus 2 equals 4. And guess what? That's even true in our, our world, the actual world, right? 2 plus 2 equals 4. So that's what it means to be necessary. If something is necessary in one world, then it will be necessary in all possible worlds. Okay? And if you have something that it might be true in most worlds, but there's at least one world where it's not true, then it's not necessary. Wait, did I say that right? <laughs> If it's necessary in one world, it will be necessary in all worlds. But if you have something that's true in most worlds, but not in one, then it's not necessary. Okay? So, but if it's necessary, if it cannot be otherwise in one world, then it's necessary in all worlds. So, 2 plus 2 is a good example. It's always for in every possible world, including the real, actual world in which we find ourselves. So, even in another reality where the, where the, even if another reality were the real one, where unicorns exist and where I'm really fat, uh, two plus two will still equals, equal four because it's necessary. In the same way, if something is necessary in another reality, it's necessary in all realities, including our reality. Now, if the ontological argument which we have, I haven't shared it with you yet, but if the onto, ontological argument is valid and sound, and I think it is, then the ontological argument is going to show that if it's even possible that God exists, then he does exist necessarily. I've got to tell you, the first time I ever heard of the ontological argument, it was over coffee with a, I was having coffee with a, a friend of mine who was a pastor, and he, he had some philosophical training, and he talked about the ontological argument almost in passing, and I said, whoa, whoa, what'd you say? He said, oh, if it's even possible that God exists, then he must exist. And I was like, whatever, that's got to be the worst argument I've ever heard of. And man, I got to tell you, as I've studied this more and more and more, I've become more convinced that this is a good argument. Like I said, it's controversial, and it's usually the argument I share last. I don't start with this one. But let's keep going. Let me, uh, let me see if you guys have learned anything. Let's take a pop quiz. So get, get out a piece of paper, pen and pencil or whatever. I got three questions for you in this pop quiz. Justin, come on, man. You're, you're not being a good student there in the back, back of the room. <laughs> All right. You get an F for the day. Sorry. Uh, I'm just messing with you. All right. <clears throat> question one. Question one. If it seems that something could be real, it should be possible. Yes or no? Question two. If something is possible, then it exists in a possible reality. Yes or no? Question three. If something is necessary or impossible in a reality, in a world, then it's necessary or impossible in all realities or all worlds. Yes or no? All right. Hand your quizzes to the person behind you. And what's great? I'm just kidding. You don't have to do that. The answer to each of those questions is a resounding yes. Anybody get 100%? All right.
A couple of you. I'm just kidding. I think you all. All right. Um, good job, guys. Now, the question that's raised is this. If God exists, if God were real, what sort of thing would God be? How would we describe him? Well, God, by definition, if he exists, is a maximally great being. He would be someone that's so great that nothing would be greater than him. Nothing could be greater than him. This is what it means to be God by definition. If God is great, what sorts of things would make him great? This gets us into something called great making properties. Great making properties. Uh, I spent a lot of time talking about the big three. The big three of God's omni attributes, his characteristics, right? Uh, number one, that, that the being is all powerful. If you're a maximally great being, whatever you are, if you're maximally great, you will be all powerful or omnipotent. You will be all knowing or omniscient if you're a maximally great being. And you would also be all loving or omnibenevolent. Again, these are referred to as the big three of God's omni-attributes. But there's more. This being would be immaterial. That means that this being would not have a physical body. Well, why is that? Because God, if we're talking about a maximally great being here, is the creator of space and time. He cannot be a physical object if he created all physical objects. We talked about this when we discussed the Kalam cosmological argument. Whatever caused time and space to begin existing cannot be found in time or space, right? So uh, space and matter was began to exist, so whatever created it could not be found in space or matter. Also, a maximum great being... Um, would be something that could not be destroyed. So, because things made of matter can be destroyed, and God cannot be destroyed if he created matter, how would you destroy an immaterial thing? Uh, so God, or the maximally great being anyway, would be a being who is indestructible. That is to say that nothing can ever destroy the maximally great being, or make him stop existing. If something could do that, then that would be the maximally great being. Let's go to the next one. The maximally great being would exist necessarily. All right, so this would be a being who is necessary. He would be so great that if he existed, he would exist not just in some realities, not just in one or two, but in all possible worlds, all realities. I was thinking about this earlier. I need to think about it a little more. But, you know, as we, as we studied the fine-tuning argument not long ago, some atheists appeal to uh, the multiple or the multiverse hypothesis to try to escape the fine-tuning uh, or the intelligent design conclusion from the fine-tuning argument, which then points to God. And they'll say, no, there's a multiple, there's multiple universes. Some will even say there's an infinite amount of, of universes out there, not just our universe. But some of these atheists would then say, you know, refer to some universe-generating machine, whatever that, anything but God, right? <laughs> but whatever this generating machine, this universe-generating machine is, is churning out these different worlds, right? these different universes. Um, think about all these universes slash worlds that it's creating. Right? Now, in, each, in any one of those universes, is it, would it be true that the universe generating machine doesn't exist? No, because those worlds are contingent on that thing. Now, it's, it's not exactly an equivalent analogy here, but I think it just starts to help us get a picture of what's going on, going on here. Um, so if there's a, a generating machine that's churning out all of these multiple universes, 
then there's no possible universe that exists in which the universe generator does not also exist in the same grand scheme of reality. All right, maybe that helps you, maybe it hurts you, I don't know, but <laughs> let's keep going. We talked about all these great making properties. So is it greater to be powerful or all powerful? What's greater? Of course. It's greater to be able to do all things that are logically possible than just a few things, or even a lot of things. But if you can do all things that are logically possible, then of course, that's greater. Is it greater to be a contingent kind of thing, like you and I are, or to exist necessarily? That you cannot fail to exist. You cannot, nothing can destroy you if you exist necessarily. But if you're contingent, you can be destroyed. What's greater? To exist contingently or necessarily. necessarily. It's obvious. You see, all of these things make God great because he would be greater or better if he had these things than if he did not have these things. So, God, if he exists, is the sort of being who is so great that nothing is greater than him. God would be all-powerful, all-knowing, all-loving, indestructible, immaterial, and necessary. Now, I've got to tell you, I interact with Christians quite often who deny the maximal greatness of God. I spend a lot of my time dealing with other Christians who deny God's, at least one of God's omni-attributes. In fact, I've got a whole argument called the omni-argument um, discussing this. But I've got to tell you, Christians, we, we must uphold that God is a maximally great being. Typically, I don't want to bash on anybody here, but it's typically those who affirm Calvinism that will reject at least one, if not all three, of the big three. You know, for example, uh, it's quite often like Arthur Pink, a notable Calvinistic theologian, says that God is not omnibenevolent. He does not love all people. He made it clear. Um, others will say that God's not omnipotent. He's not powerful enough to create a creature with libertarian free will. God simply does not have that power. Well, okay, well then, you're saying that God's not all-powerful. And others will say he's not omniscient, that he doesn't know all things, that if he could create a being with libertarian free will that God simply does not know what that free creature would do. Well, I, I think it's better to hold to, the, to hold to the concept of God being a maximally great being um, as opposed to just being more committed to a specific view about God. Uh, seems like that's almost a false idol. So God is a maximally great being, and we've got to be careful that we affirm that, that truth. So God is so perfect that nothing is more perfect than him or could possibly be better than God. Almost done here. Let's get to the, to the argument and we'll wrap it up. So, here's one version of the ontological argument. Premise one. The idea of God is possible. Step two. Therefore, it's possible for God to exist. Step three, therefore God exists in a possible reality, a possible world. Step four, in the reality or world where God exists, he is necessary. Step five, therefore God is necessary in all realities or worlds, including our reality. Our world, just as two plus two is necessary in every single world, if God is necessary in one world, he will be necessary in all worlds. Step six, if God is necessary in our reality or in our world, this means God must exist in our reality and in our world. Final conclusion, step seven, therefore, God exists in our reality, in our world. That's the ontological argument, at least one version of the ontological argument. And this, is, this argument is amazing because it proves, logically, that God must exist just from the idea of God, that it's possible.
for God to exist. It's crazy. But if it, if it is even possible that God exists, then he does exist. God is maximally great. But some people think the ontological argument is too easy because it seems that we could just use it to prove all sorts of crazy weird things. All sorts of weird things exist if they're possible to exist, not just God. Well, next time we're going to see if that's true or not. So, to be continued. <laughs>